I hate landlords in New York. Aren't they the worst? I don't think I've ever met one that I'm like, you're a really great person. <laughs> Yeah. Like I have, I had a broken window in my apartment and I emailed my landlord to come fix it. And then he emailed me back. He was like, I'll be on that ASAP. And it's been two months since he's fixed it. So I think he thinks ASAP means actually, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's too much. I, I can't get on that. <laughs> You do a bit, let's say it's dark and you get, you feel like an intense reaction from the audience that's not a laugh that like, sometimes that could like uh, floor you a little bit or kind of like kick your knees out from underneath you. But now I feel like if you sense that tension or if you know that's a possibility that can happen, there's a way of like releasing that tension with the joke and that you can get them back on your side again. So sometimes you can use those like moments as an advantage, I think. Now we're living in the moment because I do run into that problem of like, I'm just going to go up and tell the jokes that I've been doing for the last month or so or a few months. And you go into like your autopilot. And I think some people can sense that. So I feel like when you're really paying attention to the audience and how they feel like now you're just living in the moment and you're playing off their vibes and then you use it for your advantage. And then you're like, okay, now we're just having fun. I go on like, why is that weird? Why do? Why is that something that sticks in my mind? You might not have a joke about it or a, a definite setup and punchline, but I would definitely like explore that area. That like, why are you feeling this way? You can't laugh at that. Today's guest is Sarah Talamash. Sarah is a comedian. She's a writer. She hosts a podcast, although it is on hiatus at the moment. Uh, you've seen her on The Last Comic Standing. She's been featured on Comedy Central. She's been on Colbert. And you can find her album, Voluptuous Boy, anywhere comedy albums can be found. She tours the country. She's been in comedy festivals. And she is at all the clubs in New York. Uh, you can regularly see her at The Cellar, New York Comedy Club, which is where she recorded her album. If you want to hear Sarah's full album, it's available on Amazon. The link is in the show notes, so click on that link and enjoy. Sarah. Sarah. Sa <laughs> Just bored, David. Eat your weed. <laughs> <laughs> I will. You can't laugh at that. Welcome to You Can't Laugh at That. This is the podcast where uh, we take topics that aren't funny and we prove that they are funny. Uh, joining Steve and I today... Uh, this is our first time back in the studio, so uh, work with us as we're we're playing with some technical difficulties and things like that. But joining us today from New York City is Sarah Tolomash. What's Hi guys. going on? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's it's great to see things opening back up. It's great to see that even like some of the rooftop shows are still a thing. Um, so yeah. Uh, I haven't done a Zoom show in a while though, so I'm hoping those are on the way out. Yeah, you're not a not a huge fan. Um, they're okay. They served a purpose during pandemic or quarantine, and I thought it was still a good way to, like, test out material. You could gauge if something hit or ate it, but, right. and it was nice if you ate it, the bar was so low that it didn't even hurt your feelings. <laughs> yeah. Right. You'll never work in this town again. Uh, yeah. Like, what's, no one, no one knows. <laughs> right. You'll right. never work on this server again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never work nowhere again. Did you ever do one of those nowhere <laughs> comedy club shows? Uh, probably. I'm. It doesn't jog any memory or whatever, but it. I guess it kind of sounds familiar. I don't know. I don't pay attention to a lot of stuff yeah. or emails. I'm like, I'll just show up. Just give me the location. I'll show up. Yeah. Yeah. Give me the link and we're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, d now you... you dropped your album right before the pandemic, pretty much. Um, or, or was it during the pandemic? It was during, it was in the summer of the pandemic, but I had, uh, I had recorded it, uh, like a week before we shut down. Okay. Okay. And so, so as you're doing these Zoom so shows, are you working out new material or are you like trying to, to, uh, keep up with the old stuff and like make sure that you're still delivering it the, the way it's meant to be delivered? Well... Uh, I've definitely come up uh, with like 
new material just because I feel like once you do the special or album, you kind of, it's nice to put it to rest because those bits I'd been doing for a while, but there were a few newish stuff. But even uh, afterwards, I was like, I'm still tagging old bits. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you're like, oh, I just thought of an idea for that. So I, I wouldn't mind bringing it back. I've heard some comics do that on, they'll have, like, I think Mitch Hedberg did it, mm-hmm. like, uh, on another special. He's like, I know I've already done this joke, but I've added on to it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as long as it's funny, as long as that adds to the joke, you know, it's yeah. uh, you have permission to do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Also, I just feel like something, some things never feel like they're over. Like, it's never perfected. So you're always, like, still working on stuff. Mm-hmm. Right, right. There's no day where it's just like, oh, I did it. I made it. I, I'm done. Yeah, I've reached, I've rung the bell. It's yeah. time to go home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that's, and that's, unfortunately, that's, uh, kind of a prevalent idea in our society. Like, you can say, oh, you're always growing, you're always growing, but there's so many people who never open a book after they graduate from college. Like, oh, why would I want to learn something new? Come on. Oh, yeah. I, I feel like I, I can be in that category as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but you're constantly, like, working on stuff. You're constantly, like, adding, yeah. to, adding to stuff, so. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. So being open-minded is... is uh, it's vital to finding the humor in any given situation. It's vital to like personal growth, and also it feels better, for sure. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So today we are going to talk about a bit off of your album "Voluptuous Boy," which you can find anywhere uh, you can find albums. Uh, we're going to talk about your bit about your landlord. Hmm. So uh, would you like to introduce the clip? We pick it up uh, pretty much right when you start talking about him. Um, uh, well, I'd like to clarify that my landlord of present day is really nice. And this was the one that I had a few years ago. And a lot of New Yorkers, I feel like, have had the same kind of landlord. Uh, they're usually from another country. And <laughs> it's like the stuff that you feel like you're complaining about, they're like, this would be a luxury in our the country that I'm from. So mm-hmm. it's, it's always really funny. It feels like you're like, I don't know. I, don't, I felt like living in New York sometimes feels like you're camping where you're like, no, no, that's just like, this is nature. This is what you're dealing with. <laughs> mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a good analogy. Um, yeah. It, so there's kind of, there's a little bit of a culture gap there because I mean, I, I lived in a building when I lived in New York, the, the super lived in the first apartment and he had like, 14 kids and they were always just running around the courtyard of the apartment and like it was chaos all the time he would come to your apartment and fix things at 3 a.m like why aren't we doing this during the day (laughs) oh yeah one time i woke up with him he had lived two blocks away from me and he made us pay we had to pay our rent in cash and uh he would never let you be a few days late and so i was running i had to wait i had one more shift to bartend and I made that money and he said, come by as soon as you get it. So it happened to be at 1230 at night. He said, come by. And he was so adamant. And so I gave it to them. And then I woke up with him in my living room the next day, which I thought was weird. Yeah. For Why was it <laughs> like for the money or? I, well, he's on my couch. I wake up to Sada. <laughs> <laughs> it was so livid because you're not supposed to do that like no. because you own the place doesn't mean you get to come in wherever whenever you want and I felt like he had crossed a boundary that I had left my own apartment and I left him there yeah Ew, that's that's creepy yeah <laughs> yeah creepy. and he would always be like you, you know talking about my personal life being like I shouldn't have I, I was dating this is when I was dating Joe we weren't mm-hmm. married but he would stay over at our pl- my place all the time just at night he wasn't there during the day but like he would definitely be like the you know why I shouldn't let a guy stay over which I thought was out like crazy <laughs> but then there he is the next morning <laughs> <laughs> the tea's ready uh, yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, so here is a clip from Voluptuous Boy about uh, Sarah's landlord. Previous landlord, full disclaimer. Previous, yes. <laughs> I hate landlords in New York. Aren't they the worst? I don't think I've ever met one that I'm like, you're a really great person. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah. Like I have, I had a broken window in my apartment, and I emailed my landlord to come fix it, and then he emailed me back. He was like, "I'll be on that ASAP," and it's been two months since he's fixed it. So I think he thinks ASAP means actually. Sorry. Uh, Too much. I, I can't get on that. <laughs> it's a lot of work. He also did this other thing. If he did come and fix it, he would never be like, "Oh, that's so horrible. I'm so hard. That's so bad that you're going through that." Like, instead, he would just accuse me of doing things that I wasn't doing. That's why the product broke. Like, I had a shower head fall out, and instead of fixing it, he was like, Seta, you cannot be hanging on your shower head like that, okay? <laughs> it just is not made for a grown woman to be swinging on a shower head, okay? Now, uh, I'll get, try to get on it, but there's nothing I can do, you know? He'd be like, you gotta stop roundhouse kicking your doorknobs, you know? They can't take that brute force. You just close it gently like this. I'm like, all right, thank you. I'm such a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I, from your perspective, um, that bit, obviously, was that, did you write that like as this experience with your landlord was happening? Or uh, did it take a little bit of time for you to be like, oh, here's, here's a bit? That one came later because it didn't. Ha I because I had sent an email to him. I was like, "Can you fix this?" And he was like, "I'll be on that ASAP." And it took him three weeks. And I was like, "What an why would you say ASAP when you're like it's taking you this long to fix something?" And I don't usually. I do sit down and write, but I rarely get jokes that way. Uh, but I do do it uh, just so I can feel like I'm being productive. And that was one of the few jokes that I had wrote, written from just sitting down. The only way that I could think of is like ASAP, what could it actually mean? And he was such a, it was so flighty that I just like ended the, I didn't even know how to end the, the P part. And then I thought of <laughs> as, you know, like what you do when you're like, ah, I'm out of excuses. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I like that bit so much. Um, I, I like that it is it, it kind of dips into the absurd the absurdity of like the way certain I guess landlords behave um it's just like making like any excuse not to have to pay to fix it yeah <laughs> you gotta stop hanging from the and it's I think that's very funny that's that's universal landlord accent yeah <laughs> every landlord talks like wasn't that. the landlord in dirty work wasn't he like and if you do it again, I punch you in the stomach. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember even if that, but that fits if it's the stereotype. I'm not familiar with the reference, but yeah. Dirty Work is a movie with uh, Norm MacDonald, and it's a classic uh, plot of a movie where it's like, we got to raise $50,000 in a week got so it. we can get Grandpa out of the hospital. Got like, it. that kind of thing. <laughs> got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, uh, I, and so the, the shower head thing like that that <sighs> seems rooted in reality uh, but then you know just the exaggerated you've got to stop roundhouse kicking your doorknobs mm -hmm. like um, just any excuse not to not to um, not to pay to fix it or to, to like jerry rig it or whatever anything to get out of uh, paying your security deposit back because that money is gone <laughs> yeah Ugh. when she starts off with like oh landlords are the worst people they didn't go <laughs> yeah they were like oh well Take this to a new, a good direction because I've heard this a million times, mm -hmm. or I, you know, uh, and she did, and so that worked out really well. Yeah, provide the supporting details to your thesis, and, and it's like based in reality. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. yeah, provide. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. If you're gonna make a statement like that, give me the reasons why, in from your experience, and then by the end, we'll we'll know whether or not we're on board or not. I feel like you can touch on any topic, and as long as you know, you take it into a an original direction because uh, like I said, as long as it's based on a real experience, but if you go into a hack topic and it's not based on a real experience, you're already, you really got to come with something original. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, so mm -hmm. that's good. And then, and the supporting details here were, you know, he doesn't show empathy when, you know, things go wrong that are outside of my control. All right. That's one mm -hmm. thing he takes forever to fix things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when he does come to fix things, he blames me for it. So, boom, 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 three three supporting details. You can't laugh at that. When you say you don't write, like you don't sit down and write, what's your process typically? 
I think it's just from ruminating. Is that the word? Ruminating yeah. about uh, stuff that kind of bothers you. And you're like, why does that bother me? And it's just me obsessing about something. And then sometimes I try to take it from a problem solving angle or I try to make fun of it so I can feel have some power over the situation or maybe uh, deflate it a bit. And so I usually kind of write from driving or doing the dishes or just talking it over with friends. I find it's stagnant when I sit down at a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're- like I just feel like you go down different avenues when you let your mind wonder or somebody's asking you a ton of questions about it. Right. Right. Do you do you question yourself? Like, do you ask yourself questions as like a prompt to kind of like lead your brain to a to a specific uh, point? Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, why? Because there's a lot of things where I cannot explain why it evokes a feeling in me, but it just does. I guess one example is it is like the avocados where I was having a night of like I actually just had a thought of like, shit. I have a spot tonight, but like. Uh, I wish I didn't because I really want to get to those avocados. And I couldn't believe that a fruit slash vegetable was taking up so much (laughs) mental real estate in my mind. And then so I just thought it would be a funny excuse to, you know, tell somebody I couldn't make it to like an event. Like, I'm sorry, I cannot make it. My avocados are about to expire. And I felt like that was a relatable problem. So that's like one, that was a thing that I was just thinking about on the way to a spot. Okay. So, I mean, that, so that's a, that's a pretty like, not really mundane, but it, it's, you know, the, the, the stakes are low on that one. Yeah. Do you use kind of that same mentality when it comes to something bigger? Uh, so the landlord example, that's something a little bit bigger, but I mean, further beyond that, when it comes to something that that's a little bit more like personal or, or uh, God forbid, tragic. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I always uh, think of jokes in the most, like, you're, at times when you probably shouldn't joke about, like, e- even from, like, a young age, I remember getting in trouble a lot for thinking about being, like, thinking that this was funny to joke about. Like, I remember the first time I got in trouble was making fun of the challenger when I was in second grade in gymnastics and now looking I had my gymnastics coach took me aside and like explained to me why that wasn't funny and I understood but at the time I just I thought because we were so far removed from it that it was fine it didn't even cross my mind sometimes I think maybe I'm psychotic Mm -hmm. no you we just process things differently I think um yeah the thing I love about comedy is the exploration of nuance is because most people like something like that will happen and very quickly it's like apply a label to it. And then all of my feelings are based off of like, Oh, that's a tragedy. Oh, that's terrible. So everything anyone says about it has to be in that same, like in that same vein. Whereas, you know, you, uh, in second grade. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Cause it was 1986. 1980- Seven yeah. or eight, yeah. And I rem- it was when I was in gymnastics, and I remember that was like in second grade. I've had, I mean, I've had conversations. My mom, I remember my mom would always be like, "Sarah, I don't know why you find that funny." Yeah, again, it's it's that mentality of like it is. It has to be this one way, and if you betray that, then now we're the ones asking you questions. It's like, no, I'm the one asking questions about what this means. In yeah, the first yeah. Place. You know, when you do have something, so something, again, going back to the landlord example, like, it's it's frustrating, it's it's annoying, it's, you know, I pay money for this, and, and you're oh, giving you me these Oh, you feel powerless. Excuses. Yeah. And there's so, I mean, sometimes the way that those, like, people, I don't like sometimes the way that people talk to me, like, for him to, you know, instead of taking accountability of some, like, a shoddy product in his apartment that he wouldn't fix, like... To just blame me for slamming the door hard or, you know, like horse playing is so ballsy. And I couldn't believe that somebody would insinuate. I was like, just why can't, how about you just have like a faulty doorknob or your shower head sucks? Why does it have to be, I'm the one that's doing bad stuff to it, which is so, (laughs) so funny to me to think that way. Like it was so crazy. And so that was, I was like, how can I heighten this to even more, like, absurdity? 
So what was the actual story behind it? Was it the shower head or, or was it something? It was the shower different? head. And it was all like, he would also be like, do not do, try not to flick the switch so hard. Uh, like I was just like this bull in a China shop situation. It's kind of the same way of like, you know, I remember waiting tables and somebody would be like, don't spit in my food. And you're like, why would you insinuate? What a horrible thing to insinuate that I'm that kind of person that would just spit in your food. <laughs> like, I feel like that's projection, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So when somebody does like microaggressions like that, that really drives me insane. And so those are the things that I feel like I lack control of. And I think I try to like at least find humor and get other people to like relate to me of like, see, don't you see why this is crazy? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's where it comes from, I think. Yeah, and we can all relate to that. Uh, we Whether it's a landlord or not, like we've all had, a, there's a person who is, you know, has those microaggressions or a person who, you know, says something that's that's a little bit ridiculous that it's like, okay, now you're ruining my day. Um, yeah. Do you, how long does it take for you to make that mental shift between, oh, this is ruining my day to, oh, no, this is actually material? Sometimes it can be instantaneously, but sometimes I don't even realize that I've had a microaggression until about an hour later when I'm sitting on the train and I'm like, well, oh my God, I got, I can't explain why I had like a, a little bit of an anger boil up inside of me when that happened. And then I have to process why that was so irritating to me. Cause one time I was explaining, I was waiting tables once in Houston and this guy, table was so atrocious and the guy pulled my I had to wear a tie pulled my tie down and adjusted it while I I was talking to him and I couldn't figure out why that bothered me and I was telling my dad and my dad was like because he was like trying to dominate you in a a very micro way Mm -hmm. and I was like that's I couldn't figure out what it was Mm -hmm. yeah and I don't even it's not until later and so when stuff like that bothers me I try to think of ways that I could handle it and sometimes it's humorous or it's like a problem solving and then it makes me feel better afterwards. Mm. And to know how to deal with it the next time that happens. If somebody else comes to you with a a similar problem, are you somebody that would try to cheer them up? Like what's your move? Uh, Do you try to help them find the funny in it, the humor in it? Because I do that almost to a fault sometimes. Like, you know, somebody will lose somebody and I, I decided I wanted to do comedy because I made people laugh at like the funeral of, of somebody that was close to me who died. And it yeah. was, you know, so that is my move, but not everybody's ready for that. No, I totally agree. Like sometimes you feel like some people are on a certain page because I remember one time this, he, he was a friend, but I wouldn't say he was close enough to me, but he was explaining his ordeal where he had broken up with his girlfriend or wife and then they had sex in between in the breakup but then like she also was seeing somebody else and then she got pregnant and then they didn't know who the dad was and I go when are you going to be on Maury and I thought that was funny and I thought we could all (laughs) I thought he was in the mindset and now looking back I was like he did not find that funny whatsoever <laughs> and I was like maybe I didn't know him well enough to joke like that but I knew my friends liked it and so I thought that like now looking back I was like I definitely crossed a boundary with that one and I felt I feel bad like I feel bad about it but I thought it was a funny statement at the time and I couldn't help it myself. Why do you think um, people tend to resist things like that? Well, I sometimes I think so, some people don't have a sense of humor about themselves. Like, I think I could have taken that with a grain of salt. Or, you know, like, that. I think that would have been, as long as the statement's funny, I would have been like, that's really funny. And I would have gone with it. I'm like, I don't know, we're still waiting. He hasn't replied to our emails or whatever. Uh, but that's how I... I am, uh, and gen- like I'm open to that kind of humor, even if it's about myself. But there are a lot of people that don't, that really do take themselves seriously, and they can't joke like that. And I, I try to make, I make note of that mm-hmm. when I'm around them. Have you ever had anybody uh, come to you after the landlord joke, like, "Hey, I'm a landlord, and that's you know, you calling us all bad people? That's not true." <laughs> Have you ever had anything like that happen? 
No, unfortunately not. I feel like everybody's on the sa- in the same boat with landlords. I mean, <laughs> I you know, like during the summer when everyone was like cancel rent, there was part of me that's like, hey, these landlords are actual people too, and they're not huge. Like, uh, this is their business, and if we don't pay them, like, what are we? What's going to happen with them? Like, they owe the bank money. So I did have like, I did commis- commiserate with their ordeal. But like, I think when, when we're not in a pandemic, we all hate our landlord. Anybody that I always say my biggest problem in life is like, if I didn't have to pay rent, then my life would be pretty great. Right. But yeah. They, but then they have to pay the mortgage and property taxes and so <laughs> yeah. on. So so there, if I didn't have to pay rent is so much like, there's so much more to it. I know it's a deeper, it's a deeper issue. But I think you always resent the person that you owe money to. Right. Yeah. They, they could be donating all that money to charity and you're like, ah, give me uh, give me another week. They're not. Oh yeah. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> the charity is my kids uh, my kids soccer equipment so or whatever. That's their yeah. daughter's name charity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and then you may yeah, I mean you you make you just kind of have that aside at the beginning of the bit of, you know, landlords aren't I, I forget how you worded it. And and I was kind of having this thought too. Like nobody becomes a landlord because that's their dream. <laughs> like nobody's like, you know what? <laughs> it's on my vision oh. board. No, sometimes I think about like, oh, how nice it would be to own uh, property or like, you know, have to have some sort of passive income coming in. But like uh, dealing with tenants, you just hope you have good ones. But majority of of the time, like. Uh, you're just dealing with complaints and stuff that happen at uh, a horrific hours of the day and that you have to come by and fix it. Yeah. It's not a job I would want le- legitimately. Like I on New Year's Day we came back from the holiday and our bathroom had it just like exploded shit from everybody's apartment into our t- bathroom and so we're renters so we had to call our landlord. He couldn't get a plumber and he had to do he had to fix it. Right. On New Year's Day, like that sucks. But we, I was so grateful that we're renters. <laughs> right. I, that, that's where my head's at. Like my dad's like, when are you going to buy a house? And I'm like, I don't know if I want to. I want somebody else to fix my problems. I don't want to have yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, an HVAC go out. That's like several, that's like $1,200 you have to replace. It's not cheap. And it, all that stuff happens at the most inopportune times. It's yeah. never convenient. No. No, it never is. Uh, we lost a fridge, a washing machine, um, a furnace, all within like two months at my at where I live, and uh, we like we were complaining because it was taking her a while to get it. But I mean, she she means well. It just takes her a while to to take action on things, and so it's yeah. like thirty degrees outside, and we're all like bundled up, and complaining like it's the worst thing ever. But it's all about perspective. You yes. Know, you got to be able to take that step back. And um, you kind of make the character of your landlord in the bit kind of like likable to an extent. Like the the ridiculousness of like you can't be hanging on the on the shower head. It's like <laughs> what world well, does this guy live in where that's a thing? Maybe he had a previous tenant like Well, he did like that one was like an embellishment, but it was about like you, you know, like uh, insinuating that I was um, being so harsh or like a bull in the china shop. Uh, and he was likable because like people like that are funny. Mm-hmm. It, it's like when you're talking about people that you work with sometimes, sometimes they're annoying to deal with. But in, in the scheme of things, you're like, it's how enjoyable is this? This is really like the spice of life. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's the best. I, I have so many stories. I actually used to, I worked at Caroline's as a server for a couple of years um, in like 2012 to 14. And one of the managers, uh, one shift, like somebody dropped a tray of drinks in the kitchen and it was super stressful and everybody laughed. And then uh, the one manager came back and he was like, this is not the time or place to laugh. And I was like, we're in a comedy club. It's yeah. literally like, this is both <laughs> of those. Th- and it's like little things like that that you have to appreciate. That, that oh, Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know, Steve, landlord situation for you. You've lived in the same place for a while, haven't you? Six years. Six years, yeah. What's the, lo- what's the longest you've ever lived in a place, Sarah? Uh, probably around here in New York. Uh, so I moved in, I was like living off of Crescent Street in Astoria, I think 2009, and then I left in about 2000 and 
15. Oh, wow. That's like, that's like 20 years in New York time. <laughs> it <laughs> is. It is. Well, because I went, before and then when I lived in Houston, I think I bounced every year because it when you're in your 20s, you're just like, oh, this person's moved off. They're doing this. I'm going to have to find another roommate. Uh, oh, I found a better deal in an apartment. You can just move. But I find moving in New York is such an ordeal and it's so hard to find apartments that once you find one place that you find bearable, you just stay there forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I lived there, I lived in the same place for two years and uh, we got a steal on it. It was one of those where we, uh, where a broker took us there, um, showed us the place, and then we went back and talked to the super and he put us in touch with the, with the landlord. Oh, um, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, in hindsight, it's like, oh, well. oh, that's kind of a dick move, but, you know, <laughs> falling on a budget, I guess. Uh, and, and it was like a pretty big apartment. It was in the Flatbush neighborhood, which was just starting to get like super gentrified. Um, yeah. So, so rent prices weren't there yet. And we lived there two years. He lived there another year, but then they, uh, they were like, listen, we're going to double the rent on you if you, and, and so if you want to stay by all means, but mm. yeah. So yeah, if you find a place like in New York and it's so hard to move in New York too, it's like not fun. No, I'm I, I rented a truck and Joe was so happy to find a parking spot for it that he didn't want to move it. So we were still, I was like, what's the point of getting a moving truck if you're not putting it right by the apartment? Mm-hmm. It was so frustrating. But yeah, parking's hard to find too. So that was, it's just an or it's like, it's annoying. Yeah. 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 And, and I don't, I don't like moving, th- like things like that, doing physical things, is so, it's so boring to me. It doesn't. So it's a good thing I'm not a landlord. It's a good thing I don't own my own, my yeah. own place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that is that like on the agenda for you guys? Or are you just gonna just stay renting? Um, I I think we're pretty happy with it, but we have talked about like maybe trying to find a place outside of the city if things go well financially, like rent here, or just move ultimately outside and then do drive in you know, a few times out of the week to do spots. But even driving into the city is like, it's chaos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, I know. It's from Cleveland to New York, it's probably, it's like six and a half hours, but then add another hour and a half to like of getting into the city or getting out of the city, uh, especially getting <laughs> out of the city is a pain in the ass. It's a nightmare. I, I did a gig in Royersford, Pennsylvania Friday, last Friday, and I left with Adrian. We left the Bronx. It took us like an hour to get out just outside of New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any city, it should take a little bit. There should be a little bit of traffic. But I mean, when you have 8 million people packed into a, into one place, like there's going to be, there's going to be a a few, a, a few hiccups along the way. Although I will say driving in New York is, was one of my favorite things ever. Like, Really? It's, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's like the rush of like having to be assertive and you know, no, this is my lane, or like, you know, you really appreciate the zipper method uh, when you're when you're in New York. Oh yeah, I feel like that too. With uh, even outside of your car, that I feel like New York makes you more of an assertive person. Yeah, because oh, you okay. have to be, because then you're just gonna get walked all over. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You can't be like, oh, excuse me, sorry. Oh. Like, <laughs> Oh wait! <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're from the Midwest, so everybody's usually like, "Oh, I'm sorry." Like, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that makes it frustrating when I'm on the road. Is like, I'll give people a little bit of space to get over. You got your signal on, you know, where we're going a similar speed. Get in front of me; it's fine. Uh, and then they don't take it, and I'm like, "Well, fine. Fuck you then." <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and then you're like, "That's on you. If yeah. you didn't, mm-hmm. if you don't know how to get this last scrap of food, that's." That's your problem. Yeah, yeah I offered it to you, and uh, you didn't yeah. take it. Take my nonverbals as I'm in my car. <laughs> I'm like that here, and people are like, what is wrong with this guy? Because everybody here is just too friendly, and it's like, no, just stop. Just You're wasting my time. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, it's horrific. I mean, I, I hate people that block intersections. Ugh. <laughs> we, we could do a whole episode on driving pet peeves 100% oh, yeah, that's easy, yeah. oh man so much blood boiling like unnecessary commutes that's that's one positive for, of, uh, from the pandemic is like less road rage fewer people on yes. the road I have a, more of that yeah I have a buddy uh, who, who uh, he 
was a weed delivery guy in New York, and um, and he would like take uh, IG like Instagram stories of the empty roads, and it was crazy to see. It was so yeah, weird. It's wild. Yeah, that's why nighttime driving I don't mind because it's like it's just a different vibe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every I didn't have my car when I lived in the city, um, but like it, commuting back and forth before living there and after living there, it it makes you a better driver for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, I was in the South a couple weeks ago, and, like, the Midwest is chill enough, but the South is, like, we're going to do things on our own time. Like, we're going to merge on our own time. Everybody's got a truck. There's somebody in a four-wheeler on the back of a truck. Like, all right, this is a a whole new world. Um, Yeah. I'm slowly segueing back into the landlord conversation. um, Gotcha. By explicitly mentioning that I'm segueing back into the landlord conversation. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> you do it, David. Yeah, gotta gotta you segue somehow. But um, yeah, in the Midwest, though, like you know, the landlord situation. Of course, you know, everybody is is trying to make that dollar, um, and you know, investing in property it makes sense. But you know, out here, there, there's a little bit of a different mentality. Uh, it isn't that like let's like get my, you don't have an extra five minutes to get rent to me. Like it needs to be in now. Um, have you ever been in a situation where uh, that was like difficult? Um, where, you know, you had a landlord that, that like, actually was cool about it. Um, our, our, my, I feel like our, our landlord now is pretty cool about it. We'll just let him know. Sometimes it'll just slip our mind that it's the beginning of the month and that we've gone out of town for a gig or something. And then so it'll be like, shit, you know, we're not getting back until the 7th. And so we'll just text and he's like, oh, I know. He knows that it's not like pulling teeth. It's not like we're doing it all the time time um so he's understanding but the other one uh was he definitely was like no later he i couldn't even do it like on the third which most places even like property management places Mm -hmm. give you that grace period Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. um and they're not doing like like online you can't deposit online still not here it's like uh we give cash or check, usually check. It's weird how some, they don't do it like that. Like I know property management places do it. You can do it online, but I, there's still a lot of in New York landlords that independently own their buildings. So they don't, and they do their own thing. All right. Not accepting yeah. Bitcoin yet, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, like the one I, the previous place, I had to pay it all in cash and I was like, I'm pretty sure he's not claiming all of this. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's right. no, why are you making it? It would be so wild. Like, I would have to have, like, a, you know, $1,300 in cash with me. And I'm like, this, this is bad. Like, <laughs> I could lose this. And then my whole life is fucked right now. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Right. I, I only accept it in certain, uh, in certain bills. I need uh, <laughs> six hundreds. Eight fifties. It's like what? Nine nines, two Mac tens. I'm trying to do the Biggie song. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I only accept rent in rolls of quarters. Uh, do you have any Sacagawea golden dollars? I'll know. take those too. I mean, if I was like, if I was a stripper, it'd all be in ones. But yeah, I was bar. You know, you bartend. You're uh, like here, because you're not gonna like. You can't even pulse out money, uh, that much money, unless the bank is open and you go into their special ATMs that are inside. But mm-hmm. they don't let you pulse out that much money. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking about landlords. What about uh, supers? Um, do you do you live in a building that has a separate super from the landlord, or are they the, the same person? It's the same person. And so he'll just do, like, call out for contractual stuff like plumbing or electrician Mm -hmm. yeah so he's never really he might do the light stuff like switching out a a bulb or looking into something but he i don't think he's doing like the hard like the hard work Mm -hmm. the uh, the last place that i lived uh they would email like from different email accounts and every time it would go straight to my spam so uh they, they wouldn't like end up in my apartment but i'd get a knock on the door at a weird time like at like 10 45 at night and i'm like smoking weed and writing and i'm like who's here i'm not expecting anybody <laughs> and he's like i'm here to replace your toilet seats 
then you get the email and it's like, that's a weird, all right, cool. You're like, this is not business hour. Like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, cutting corners too. Like, you know, uh, have you ever had an experience where a landlord uh, or a property manager or whatever, like cut corners as far as like smoke detectors or, the, and I love the, the studio <laughs> apartment smoke, smoke detector bit. That's so funny. Um, oh, yeah. Well, that one, yeah. I always take out my smoke detectors because whenever you're just cooking bacon and they go off all the time and you're like, well, I'm living in one room. What is the point of having <laughs> a yeah. smoke detector? Like, I will know when shit hits the fan, like, yeah. and it's probably because I caused it. Um, so I always took out the batteries of my smoke detector in my New York apartments because I was like, they're so tiny. I don't need them. Um no, there is this thing that I noticed with like New York, land, maybe landlords are just like, I, I would say craftsmanship. I think because things are so expensive and so annoying that they're always trying to cut corners. Like I've always noticed that the cabinetry is off kilter because they do it themselves or it's really cheap wood and that everything's cheap. It's really like, uh, like it it falls apart within like a year uh like the apartment that i lived at is like uh over time you're like this will become an unlivable place uh like the the radiators just spew water onto the hardwood floors uh so it warps it uh well, oh i when we moved here like everything was nicely done and it was new looking but like the light switches were opposite like okay. the on was off and the, and then you know that they put it in there like fuck. Oh well. They'll just learn to deal with it. Or like the the uh, hot and cold water are on the opposite sides. It's always always like that in New York or it just never drains fully. Right. There's yeah. a little bit of standing water at all times. <laughs> yes. Like I remember my roommate's girlfriend would crash with us for like a summer and she would be like did you know that, like, I'm just standing in water? I'm like, yeah, that's just nature. Like, you <laughs> camping. Like, you, you can't complain about this. This is just like, you just learn that's what you're dealing with, that you just accept that. And you're like, it's kind of nice to have hot water around your calves while you shower. <laughs> like, like, I don't care. Yeah. Just be like, just be glad it's not coming out the other way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then also you're like, I just don't want our landlord here as well. I don't want, I want him to be here the, the least amount of times as possible. Mm. Do you feel like judged? Be, yeah, I feel, I do feel judged or I'll get some comment of like, you know, Sarah, you cannot have these guys over. You need to marry them. And it's like, it's just like less is more. Yeah, exactly. When, yeah. when are you going to have 14 kids, too? <laughs> it's the only way to live. Uh, no, lower rent. We'll see. I know. <laughs> right. And, I, you know, there's there's a lot of good people who own property, so this isn't to, like, totally bash Absolutely. on them. Uh, you know, but there's enough that you can stereotype. Sure. I'm 100%. Yeah. And you know that that there's somebody who is out there who's a comic somewhere who is who owns property who's had awful tenants who has like bits about that. So, you know, there's yeah. it it goes both ways. And uh it's so like, I was going to say like Greg Warren has a bit that I really like about eating in New York where he sees a mouse and they're like, "Oh no, that's an outside mouse." Like <laughs> all, everybody has like their own way of spinning the shit <laughs> of living in New York into something like that's not my problem where you're like yeah, well it's you shouldn't have mice in your establishment and I love that you're like no that's an outside mouse <laughs> <laughs> yeah no pets that's an extra charge yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, we're gonna charge yeah we had mice really bad one year uh the people across the hall they renovated their apartment and um, they were slobs. Well, well, they were they were evicted. Yeah. They were kicked out. Um, and then the the property manager renovated their apartment. And then all of a sudden, we just had dozens of mice all at once. And uh, we were like, "Hey, can you do something about this?" And they were like, "Read the property, uh, read the agreement." And it was like, "Oh, we have to take care of it ourselves." Yeah, and that was <laughs> that was not fun. None of That's the snap wild. traps worked. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. No, we had a mouse situation in our apartment for the summer during quarantine, and uh, I, I 
It was cute. It was just one. But everyone's like, if you have one, you have a million. But that wasn't true. We just had one. And uh, he died, of course. Oh. But yeah. <laughs> you developed a relationship <laughs> with him. I did because like he would come out at nine o'clock almost every night on the dot and he would just be under the table. And they usually hang out around the stove area because that's where all like the loose crumbs fall out. Um, and then, yeah, he would come out every, and it, he was cute. It was just a mouse. It wasn't a rat. And so I kind of was like, I don't mind him if it's just one. And then, but we got traps because you're just like, it's unsanitary. Uh, and they, I got the sticky ones because I wanted to be humane. But apparently that's actually pretty, they will rip their limbs off to get out of this. But I got him and then I just took him outside and then I doused a whole bunch of olive oil on him and he freed. But then he came back two weeks later. People said they will come back mm-hmm. and he did. And that's when we had to do like, whatever snap traps and i heard like two in the morning i just hear like a whack and a little squeal and it was like uh he's gone right. <laughs> that was uh, it <laughs> that was of your doing then yeah <laughs> yeah we, we did the the sticky trap thing and felt awful um it, oh it's yeah. off it's i mean i would I never do it again you don't want to see an animal like in pain but you're also like you can't live here buddy yeah <laughs> yeah you, you can't and then you brought your friends like that's that's that person you invite to the party who all of a sudden like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah my boy, uh, my boy from high school's in town. He's bringing some of his friends, and then it's like, all right, yeah, this is a totally, not happening. This is not the party that I signed up for. Uh, Steve, any have you had any situations uh, where you're you looking back and and uh, finding the humor in it as far as landlord or? Well, I was going to say something about mice. I mean, if you have a cat the only problem with that is it won't necessarily kill the mouse right away it might just bring it in your bed yeah so that's the the downside of having a a cat to take Mm -hmm. care of that i don't have any i've had a lot of weird roommates i had one guy who smoked crack in his room didn't know he was smoking crack did not come across as a crack smoker uh and he used to take a shower with uh bathing trunk or uh, swim trunks on and (laughs) it's a never dude i've had so many weird roommates (laughs) oh yeah I mean, that's like, I remember I had one roommate who would always, he'd party and he would have like maybe a day or so just being hung over in his apartment. And I knew I was friends with him, but not close enough to just be like, hey, I'm going to do this. I was like, he could be dead for <laughs> all I know. And then the police would be like, so you just let a guy s- never come out for a week. And you're like, yeah, that's like how you do it in New York. You don't get involved in your roommate's life. Right. Right. Yeah. They could go in and out of their rooms and gone 18 hours of the day. And that's, yeah, that's New York. My favorite thing is my, when my roommates, I, I've lived exclusively, exclusively with guys and no guy knows how to cook at all. And like, I, I'm an exception and they're always yeah. like, oh, wow, how are, wow, you cook. And it's like, yeah, it's just a thing. You, it's just a life skill, you know? <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things you do when you're an adult. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's like they're all yeah. like my age or older, and it's like I don't know. Yeah, the, the, there's a stack of sm- smoke detectors with no batteries in my house too. Um, <laughs> we don't we don't have an exhaust over our, our stove, and I feel like is that the case for you too? No, or we have it? an exhaust. I think this one has an exhaust. I don't know if the other one does or not, but you do need it. Does help out anytime? I feel like when you cook pork for some reason, yeah. it just like lights up your room. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's like high fat content or whatever. I know, like when I, I cook steaks in like cast iron and I, and I give them like a hard sear so they kind of like caramelize on the outside. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that makes, that creates so much smoke. Uh, but the smoke detectors came down. We had a previous roommate who cooked all the time and multiple times a day the smoke detectors would go off and it's like upstairs, like it's a, it's a pretty decent sized house, like I don't understand how these smoke detectors all the way upstairs through a closed door are going off right now. But so now if there's a fire in my house, um, it was nice to it was nice to meet you. (laughs) No, I know. Well, like I those things do feel like inconvenience. Like I also find that with car alarms. When Mm -hmm. have you ever heard a car alarm and then go running to see if it's okay? (laughs) Like everybody hates them. Like Mm -hmm. I think they're a dumb invention. I feel like. If you have a car alarm, it shouldn't go off in the neighborhood like that. It should just vibrate your phone. Ooh. 
There you the, go. There, yeah. yeah. Shark Tank that. The keys. <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. I know because no one gives a shit about your car. I don't care about your car. Also, you know, like, you're if you parked it and your car alarm goes off in New York, you're like, I may have parked it several blocks away. So I have no, it's not like you're like, that's my car alarm. <laughs> and you go run. No one knows. It's all the same. I'm like, stop the car alarm shit. Like, it's so annoying. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's like the Amber Alert. <laughs> it's, it's, Oh, I know. The, the Amber Alert does come to your phone, though, so. But I'm still not going to do anything about it. Yeah. I, <laughs> I know. You're like, what am I supposed to do? I used to get, like, uh, when I worked at a restaurant office, uh, these kidnapping notices in the fax machine just as, like, <laughs> random occurrences. And I was like, what am, am I supposed to just stop my job? Is my boss supposed to understand that I got to go look for these kids right now? <laughs> it's so insane. <laughs> Listen, sorry. Um, can I stay clocked in for this? I feel like it's part of my duty. <laughs> I'm solve this case right now. Listen, do you want to be the company that's known as the one that didn't do anything when you had a, the choice to? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's bad PR. And then we have to come out with a press release, and that's just more work for you. What do you... Yeah. yeah. So I have to go. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's, it's just like, now's not the time. I mean, it's such like a, an ugly truth of life, but like... It is funny mm-hmm. if you're not the one that's adversely affected by it. Mm-hmm. You can't laugh at that. Today's episode of You Can't Laugh at That is brought to you by Water Cooler Comedy. Water Cooler Comedy helps teams develop their sense of humor so that you can connect deeper, collaborate better, become more creative, and have fun doing it. Because why shouldn't work be the time and place to laugh? And these are all skills that we need now more than ever in today's changing state of work. As leaders try to find new ways to be innovative and to adapt to uncertainty and to be creative in the face of change, humor is actually a skill that workers can develop to be better at their jobs and to connect deeper with their teams. It's a skill, which means it takes practice. And that's where water cooler comedy comes into play. Whether you're looking for a motivational keynote, a training workshop that brings people together, webinars, consulting, coaching, and certified classes, check us out at watercoolercomedy.org. Watercooler Comedy makes work the time and place to laugh so that you look forward to clocking in on Monday morning just as much as getting that first drink on Friday night. You can't laugh at that. As far as um, if if somebody came to you, well, first of all, has anyone come to you and be like, "Man, that landlord li- that landlord bit really uh, really hit home for me." <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> have you ever had that conversation with somebody? Um, I, I've noticed on the comments on my because I, I put it up as a special on my YouTube channel that um, that that seems to be the one that actually. I get good feedback from like the a joke that stands out that they really like. And I remember auditioning with Montreal uh, New Faces uh, years ago. And that was the one bit that like the booker was like, oh, I really like that bit. And I was always surprised that it did w- well because I felt like it was in kind of an easy bit to get to in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Is Is that why you positioned it where you did in your hour? Um, where the, the way that I position stuff is like, first I try to put all the cleaner stuff in the front and then I, it just ended up naturally going er, around maybe like the 10 minute mark, maybe, mm-hmm. um, because I try to time my jokes. Sometimes they feel non sequitur. They're just like little anecdotes. And so I try to tie them together in a way that I can memorize it. So I think I went from financial stuff to me, to my mindset of like hardships in New York because it's expensive, and then that helped me lead to the landlord. So it wasn't where I don't generally time my bits of like, especially in the middle of like, and then I'll put this bit here because that'll like at the five minute mark, that'll get them. It it's <laughs> just like where it lands. Right. You know? I feel like if you were to do that too, and it didn't get the response, it would get like for me personally, it would throw me off. I'd be like, well, shit. That was there because I thought it would make them laugh this way. Now, now what do I do? Absolutely. Like, I don't, a lot of times I don't bank on stuff like hitting the way it does. And maybe sometimes the reason why it hit as hard as it did is like the rhythm and the momentum that I've gotten all the way to that part. It just landed. It was a punchline that was strong enough. 
Hold on one second. Okay. I was like, oh, this will go great. Let's go back into the into the office, and, and it'll be awesome, and we'll all be together, and it'll be cool, and nothing can go wrong. Oh, I just assume everything will go wrong and right. then just work around that. I right. just feel like that's the way life is. Yeah. I've stopped, like, caring about stuff like that yeah. because, especially, like, if we're going to go back to the special, like, that is one of the reasons why it's so I it's so stressful to think about taping a special because you're like, ugh, what if it goes wrong? Mm. What if something goes wrong? And then you're just like, how am I going to handle that? And it just causes anxiety. But now, like, I just feel like just accept that that will happen and it, it makes it more fun. <laughs> yeah. One, uh, one thing that I always try to do, um, it, it, sometimes it takes me a second to, to do it, to, to adopt this mindset, but it's that, oh, no, this was part of the plan all along. Like, so if I yeah. approach it from that way, then it doesn't feel like it's getting in my way. It feels like, okay, now I can just roll with this. Yeah. Yeah. And like, then sometimes I like those mistakes because it's like how you respond to it instead of just being an autopilot, I think. Right. Right. And, and um as a comic, like we have that ability to be like, oh, this is this is a joke. Yeah. And and like you were saying earlier, you know, once you can laugh at it, you kind of give yourself that that power over it. Yeah. I mean, I now days like I talk about like when I you know, you do a bit, let's say it's dark and you get you feel like an intense reaction from the audience that's not a laugh, that like sometimes that could like uh, floor you a little bit or kind of like kick your knees out from underneath you. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like if you sense that tension or if you know that's a possibility that can happen there's a way of like releasing that tension with the joke mm -hmm. and that you can get them back on your side again so sometimes you can use those like moments as an advantage i think yeah i i love that i love that that push and pull um because if, if i unintentionally push them i can pull them back in with like the next joke that's yeah. like i feel like that's even more rewarding than than if everything went to plan do you do you run into that yes because then it's like, now we're living in the moment. Mm. Because I do run into that problem of like, I'm just going to go up and tell the jokes that I've been doing for the last month or so or a few months. And you go into like your autopilot. And I think some people can sense that. So I feel like when you're really paying attention to the audience and how they feel, like now you're just living in the moment and you're playing off their vibes and then you use it for your advantage. And then you're like, okay, now we're just having fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. That it is it is exciting. Do you feel that applies to everyday life too? Um, so, for example, using using the landlord uh, situation, you know, everything's going according to plan. The day's going, you know, well, and then uh, the plumbing, you know, the pipe burst or something, um, and then the landlord is nowhere to be found. Um, I feel like resisting that kind of takes you out of the moment, takes you out of that. You know, what can we do about this now? Um, based off now you have all this information like okay the pipe is burst there's water leaking there are these things in the cupboard and the, there's this much water i have these things um so like i have this bucket i have you know whatever and the landlord's not picking up like that's all information you can do stuff with rather than being like i wish this wasn't happening <laughs> yeah i think i just feel like you're to go through life easier it's easier it's better just to accept stuff and realize that it's not an a personal attack towards you and if anything maybe you'll get a bit out of it mm. apply that to uh, somebody who isn't a comic um same situation yeah. if you could give that that advice where you're you know you you run into an unfortunate circumstance within a living situation like that um would that be uh, how would you reframe that advice for for somebody who isn't a comic um well at least it'll be a story and now uh, you've broken up the monotony of your life and, uh, you know, it's something different. And it also, again, it's not a personal attack towards you or says anything about your character. It's just literal shit hitting the fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a story. That's That's like... That's a powerful self reminder. Like this is no, this is just part of the story. And plus, now you have now that you're going back to socializing with people in person, you have a story for your party that you're gonna yeah. get. You know, you've got a oh my god, you won't believe what happened to me. The other thing too is like, and I I did have a bit that was kind of in that vein of um, 
there was a part of me once I got out of debt that I was bored, like, no, like, oh no, I have no goals anymore. Like, <laughs> it's kind of good to have a little problem in your life so you have something to work on. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. yeah, imagine a movie without a conflict. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants Who to watch cares? that. Yeah, yeah like, no one cares. I like to say that you're not defined by the mistakes you make, by but you're defined by how you handle those mistakes. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. That, that, and that was the voice of God, and that, uh, yeah. that, that, that <laughs> who apparently is a huge fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was the the purpose of the the entire Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> God, God, it was a, it's a coming of age story. All right, you know, yeah. you can't drown all your problems. Right. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> you can't turn them all to salt. <laughs> um, Steve, any uh, any input as far as um, you know dealing with like a difficult landlord, difficult property manager, or anything like that? Sure, yeah, fuck landlords. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, if you were to turn it into a bit, like what what direction no. would you take? Because I know you you take a very cynical approach to your your joke writing. Did I have? I never even wrote um, joke. I just used to call my landlord my turf Jesus, and that's the only <laughs> thing I can remember about turf me Jesus. joking about landlords. Uh, I've had great landlords. Yeah, they never bother me. They fix things somewhat on time. Mm-hmm. And so, honestly, I've had some, it's hard to, it's really hard to, with my own personal experience. I've gotten very lucky. They're starting to really wrench it up, though, now. They're, they're ratchet, ratcheting up rent, and uh-huh. uh, they're asking me for renter's insurance, and I'm like, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> but I'm thinking about it, too. But, um, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with our perception of the situation and uh, being able to kind of poke fun at that, too. That's another element of, like, giving yourself power because yeah. that's actually something you can control. Yeah. It's, like, how you feel about a situation. Because mm-hmm. when they say they always, like, it's not like it's it's not hap- or happening at you or something like that. It's, like, it's not a personal attack at you. It's just, like, it's just how you deal with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find your your comedy has evolved um, into more of that? Because I think it was Louis C.K. And we had uh, Hannah Boone. I'm not sure you know who that is. Um, we had her on, and she quoted Louis C.K. And I'm going to butcher it. I'm uh, paraphrasing it. But like when you first starting start comedy, you write what you see. And then after, what you say, like seven years into it, you write what you feel. And then like after ten years, you write what you fear. Um, do you, do you follow along with that, that narrative? Um, Hmm. where, where do you, where do you like draw a lot of your inspiration from, I guess is, is where that question was leading. Probably more on the fact of where I, what I feel, but I mean, when that go in lines with what I fear, cause that's a feeling, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Yeah. It's probably, I go along a feeling like now whenever I tell like people that are like, I think I I taught like a mini little class and I told every, I go on like, why is that weird? Why do, why is that something that sticks in my mind? You might not have a joke about it or a a definite setup and punchline, but I would definitely like explore that area that like, why are you feeling this way? Mm Yeah. It's so very, I, I, yeah, I get definitely go off of a feel. It's it's very therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> to kind of ask those questions of yourself. I do a lot of free associating myself. Um, I will like as I'm like mopping the floor, I'll just put the my my recorder on on my phone and just talk, and I'll go back and listen to it. And there may be one funny thing or or like one idea that really takes off in the 20 minutes that I have to listen back to, but yeah, it, it's, and then eventually it may get to like one punchline. Um, it, it may be whittled down to that, but, um, do you use, do you do that in your, in your process, like recording yourself or just like allowing yourself free association? Like I don't record myself. Cause I, um, I mainly, it's just like mainly like I would say obsessive thoughts. If it's like a thought that I'm obsessing about, it's obviously obviously mm. something I should talk about out loud so I can like move on. Mm. Cuz it does feel better to just say it out loud. 
it does. And and I feel like the theme for this episode is, you know, you that's one way to take power over something that you can't control. Yeah. <laughs> is is kind of retell the story. Um and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to join us and and to prove that you know, from the right angle, anything can be funny. And, uh, you know, we've all got a landlord or a property manager, or if you are a landlord, a tenant who might be hanging from yeah. the, the shower <laughs> uh, <laughs> or kicking the door. Now, I had a buddy whose landlord was like, uh, when they would have a like a plumbing problem, he's like, you can't be uh, putting paper towel in the toilet. You have to put the paper towel in the garbage. And uh, yeah. he was actually referring to the toilet paper, um, but, you know, language barrier. And so he's like, what, you want me... I can't flush things down the toilet. <laughs> what are you, that are? What? Well, yeah. I mean, I just went. I went to Ecuador. You can't flush toilet paper down the toilet. You have to put it in the trash can, and it's so awkward mm-hmm. if you're with your partner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like we had to time it where if we had to go, you know, do number two. Yeah, we had to take a. Sh- we made sure we t- had to take a shower right afterwards, so I wouldn't have to use. Mm-hmm. Toilet paper. Because it's so awkward. It's like, wh- this is, because their flush power was awful. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I maybe that guy was from Ecuador or something. <laughs> but you're like, there, I, it just feels like you're like, no way in America am I not flushing my toilet paper. Right, right. Well, maybe Donald <laughs> Trump's toilets. He, he went on that rant about, uh, you have to flush like 15 times or something. Yeah. <laughs> No, like, it's why. Well, I also like it when your landlord's is like, you know, don't put your tampons in there. And you're like, well, I'm not. What monster is doing that? But then you find out there are monsters that fucking flush their tampons down the toilet. The restaurant that I worked at uh, <laughs> multiple times. Um, and the main bathroom was right above our walk in cooler. So there were multiple times where we had to shut the restaurant down and just throw everything out from the walk-in, like everything that they spent days prepping. It's so like, destructive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. The, you, you should learn that in junior high. What is this resistance to talking about things that everybody goes through? Yeah. I don't know. I, I found out a friend does that of mine, and I was, like, so judgmental about it. Mm-hmm. Like, it's almost like finding somebody – Finds that you find out that they just blatantly litter. <laughs> You're like, who fucking raised you? That's awful. Yeah, my girlfriend <laughs> flicked a cigarette in the street one time, and I was like, why are we together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, got over that one fast though. But uh, <laughs> Sarah, I, I understand the, your your podcast with Adrian uh, that just came to a close, right? Are yeah, you, we, I think we, we put it on a hiatus for okay. a little bit. We might revisit it or just do it like on YouTube. What We're not dedicated to coming out every week because it's just like I was doing the tech for it and all the promo, like, you know, mm-hmm. the behind the scenes stuff. It's a lot of work for no money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, trust me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got to subtitle these and then I try to automatically subtitle like the clips and then the, yeah. it's like, nobody said any of those words. So now I'm typing like there's. I know. And then like <laughs> writing captions for your Instagram and you're like, oh, great. It only got a hundred views. Like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you're like after a while as a business venture, if I was a, like a business manager, I'd be like, this is not good. Mm-hmm. So we shut it, we shut it down. We did have a really good time and we still hang out a lot and it wasn't because of bad beef or anything like that. Right. <laughs> that was the next question. No. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> uh, and these things, you know, come to a natural conclusion and, um, and that's what this podcast is about to do right now. Sarah, <laughs> what are you, uh, what, is there anything that you're working on right now? Any projects that you're, because uh, this will probably come out in the beginning of July-ish, middle of July-ish. So just to kind of give you a frame of reference. No, I'm just mainly trying to work up to another, like, thinking about uh, another special in the next year or so and taping it myself and putting it on my YouTube channel and then sketches. And I'm just trying to build out my YouTube so I can make my own money and not answer to anybody. Yeah, hell yeah. Well, you got to answer to the audience, <laughs> unfortunately. That's true. But, but, but not at least one they person. let me create stuff. Yeah. Where yeah. like show business just like uh, notes it, notes it, and then they're, they'll pass it, and then you didn't create anything. So I find that 
horrifically frustrating. Yeah, yeah. For for a system that demands creativity, um, you know, they, they, it's they very destructive. It. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the fact that they're demanding creativity is that's the that's the, yeah. the red flag right there. Absolutely. <laughs> Sit down. How it works. Sit down and be creative, Steve. Now I'm. Yeah, that's never worked. Right yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're like great. Hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> uh, so talk about uh, your YouTube, um, your your social media. Where can we find you on uh, on those? Oh, I think on all my social media, it's just at Stalamash. And then my YouTube, you just put in Sarah Talamash, and it should show up as my direct channel. And uh, you are SarahTComedy.com. I like that because yeah. it's like T is your middle name and your last name is comedy. Um, or T oh, is yeah. your, your middle initial. Well, I don't know what happened. I had I used to have saratalmosh.com and then when I I ran, didn't pay it for a while on whatever that service is called and then when I had to re up it, they asked for so much more money that I had to change it. Mm-hmm. That's absurd. Was it like thousands of dollars? It was a lot. It was enough that I was like not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> Sarah T is like 200 fine. bucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and and now people, uh, the, the uneducated masses, don't have to, to know how to spell your last name to find you. Absolutely. <laughs> so, 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 I so, kept it simple. SarahTComedy.com. Um, anything else you want to share with our listeners as far as um, being able to find humor in, in the little things? Yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like nothing's sacred. So have at it. Whatever makes you happy. And then know to say it to the people that, like, aren't going to judge you for it. <laughs> yeah, right. Be or care- know that you're joking. Mm-hmm. Be careful of gymnastics practices. Yeah. That's, that's what we learned here today. Uh, Steve, anything else you want to add? Uh, no, no. Rest in peace to everybody on the Challenger. And <laughs> I'm still Sorry. stuck on that. <laughs> I've heard so many Challenger jokes before. Well, not that many, but enough for me to n- remember. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Just keep coming back to that. <laughs> it was a traumatic day. Yeah, we, I think we, we lived through the, the Columbia one. I remember that one. That well, was, it was fucked up. Yeah. I mean, like, we all watched it in elementary school, and it was, like, absolutely devastating mm-hmm. and crazy. It was probably one of the first major current events that I was like, this is bonkers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, yeah, that, I, I was, I don't think I was, was I around for Challenger? If it was 87, that, I would have not remembered that, but. That would have, that was a month before I was born. Yeah. Oh, was it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. February of 1986, we're, correct? I believe yeah, so. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, rest in peace to the Challenger. We'll, we'll put a little, uh, an, an, an infographic, um. I don't stand behind the joke that I did back then. But what whatever. was it? You don't? <laughs> it's not even a joke. I just was like, oh, my God, I hope you're, I hope, I wish you were on that challenger. That's what I said. <laughs> 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 that was your first roast joke, and you didn't even know it. That was it. my first roast joke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, your career just took off from there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll bring it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super relevant. Um, <laughs> Sarah, thanks for joining us on You Can't Laugh at That and helping to prove that even if you do have a shitty landlord or if you have a shitty tenant, there's always a way to laugh at that. Mm. And podcast.